Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Corning Museum of Glass and welcome online, those of you who are tuning in. We're gonna get started here on a live stream. My name is Helen Tegler and this is a really special uh, opportunity to be able to make something really fun and I've got a fantastic team to make uh, all the my dreams come true here at Corning. Um, so I'm going to be passing the mic back and forth throughout the afternoon or f throughout the morning as well. Um, but if you have any questions and things online, please feel free uh, to get our attention. Um, there will be a lot of hectic stuff happening later on in the process, but um, early questions and throughout, we're welcome to answer those. But this is uh, Bring the Heat. This is a really fun um, new program that we've started here at the Corning Museum of Glass this fall. And we're each getting an opportunity to make something that we've practiced and that we enjoy and we love about glass. And so you can tune in every single Wednesday, kind of back and forth between this Bring the Heat and um, the live stream with all the various artists. But I'm gonna go ahead and get started and keep chatting with you as we go along. Um, I'm gonna start out, it's going to be a bit of a winter scene is what I'm starting with today. And uh, surprisingly, we woke up and there was snow on the ground this morning. So I think the universe is uh, getting ready to help me out here today with this winter wonderland theme. So that's really fun. But I've got uh, Jeff Mack here. He's gonna be also on the microphone with us throughout the morning. He's also gonna be my heavy lifter and helping uh, work on carrying this back and forth uh, as we get later on to the assemblage. Katie Hubs is joining us here today as well, and she is going to be running bits for me, working on the torch, doing a little bit of narration as well, so you're going to hear her throughout the morning. Looks like I've chosen a very crooked pipe, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that and <laughs> start with a straighter one. Chris Rochelle is going to be my master of the uh, garage here today. We've got a lot of parts and pieces um, that we've made in advance uh, to make sure that we could fit all of it in in the time frame. It's really hard to put together a really complicated sculpture in uh, just two hours, so we've been hard at work for, for days on end making all kinds of fun parts and components that are going to go into this final sculpture. Kyle Lynn is joining us here today as well. He's going to be running some doors, doing some bits, and just general uh, support throughout the day as well. He's already opening doors for me and things. Jason's up in the booth doing some uh, video work, so hopefully you get a good view of the action as well. And Amanda Kranz is here, of course, as always, on the computer. So if you have any questions, um, really field them through her online, and then she'll communicate with the team on what we have to offer. So let's get a thunderous round of applause for my team, shall we? We've got a few folks here in the crowd today. Thanks so much for joining us. But I'm gonna start out by creating one of the woodland creatures that are in, uh, that's gonna be on this sculpture. And I was really trying to channel the winter environment um, up here in New York State it gets awful cold and <laughs> we get a lot of snow throughout the year. So I really love working with sculpture and playfulness um, in that sculpture. And being here at the Corning Museum of Glass, I've had quite a bit of opportunity uh, to stretch that muscle and play around. So when I was trying to come up with what we were going to make for this live stream, my first instinct was, of course, to do something fun and seasonal. So I'm gonna be making some woodland creatures and they're gonna be decorating a tree for us today. So we got lots of different parts and components that'll come together. But I thought I would try to make the deer live. So you can at least see one of the creatures come together. So I'm gonna start out here just by adding my color. And I use predominantly frit when I'm working with sculpture like this. I really love how all the little piece, pieces of glass, the little particles of colored glass melt together and give more of a fur texture. Um, I also gravitate towards using a lot of powders um, when I'm doing sculpture. But in a busy studio like this with lots of stuff going on, I'm gonna avoid getting the puffy stuff, the fluffy stuff out. And we'll just work mostly um, with all of this here today. And 
And starting out with an iris opal yellow, this has become one of my favorite colors working with um, for animals especially because it's not just one color. It, it is one color, but it kind of looks like more than one color. So you can get some really fun uh, designs and textures on there as well. I'll just jump in whenever then, Helen. Yeah, yeah. Once you start focusing, I, I'll, I'll do some talking because Helen's going to get great. into yes. to sculpting this piece here pretty soon. So yeah, Jeff Mack's going to be on the mic here and helping out a lot throughout the morning. So it looks like Helen's got all the color she wants on the surface there. For the deer and she's going to kind of make a like an embryonic shape here to start off the deer's body so she kind of bisects it into two sections using the jacks yeah it's really about building up the quadrants here when i first started working um, a lot of sculpture i always did a lot of additive bits that's kind of how my brain worked. You just add stuff to something to build it up. But I've been really uh, challenging myself to work more pulling from the form, pulling from the, the gob of glass. So that's really what I've been playing around with with this one. So there'll be some added bits, but for the most part, I'm gonna try to pull most of this deer right out of the mass of glass. So Helen's going to go through a lot of different techniques here. She does some blowing, she does some sculpting, a lot of additive things, uh, adding things out of the garage. Helen's got a lot of experience blowing glass. She's been blowing glass for about 26 years, I think we figured out. Yeah. And uh, so she's got a lot of skill. She's got a lot of op options. And this is a really great thing to, to make something nice and seasonal that everybody can enjoy. And uh, I welcome you folks who are just joining us right here at the amphitheater. You guys are joining in in a live stream event. This is Helen Tegler. She's our artist for Bring the Heat live stream. And she's working on a piece that she calls Winter Wonderland. And right now she's creating a little character here of a little deer that is gonna be participating in this little vignette that she's creating. So Helen, uh, has a background as an artist. She's not just a glass maker. She went to art school and uh, graduated from Bowling Green State University. She also went to Sheridan College uh, and received her Master's of Fine Arts from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. So she's got a lot of education in, gla in art and in glass. And she has worked in the field as an educator at many different places, including the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, Goggle Works in, uh, in Reading, Pennsylvania, the University of Louisville, uh, and Harrisburg Community College. So she's got a lot of experience teaching and educating in art as well. And um, Helen joined the team here probably 10 years ago at the Corning Museum of Glass, working uh, for the Glass at Sea program, which was a program we had where we sent glass makers out on cruise ships and had studios for entertaining the guests who were on cruises. And we had three ships through um, Royal Caribbean Celebrity Cruise Lines that we had studios on. And that program ran for about 10 years. Yeah, and that, that was a really fun adventure. And it really taught me a lot about working with sculpture as well, because. We, it's an all-electric shop out there, so it's a little different in the way that it works, but we didn't have any torches, and we were doing um, children's You Design It programs on a weekly basis, and we were having plenty of time to play with whatever we wanted to do that day, so I ended up doing a lot of sculpture while I was out there, but it's pretty challenging without a torch, so you really have to start thinking through 
all the bits and how to work with the heat and setting up certain shapes and conditions to be able to get uh, things that look like animals or objects. So I uh, spent quite a few years out on ships, so it was really a fun challenge learning how to uh, do that kind of thing without the advantage of a torch. But I'm really grateful now I've got a torch I can play with here at the museum. Yeah, I'd say there's, uh, when you're on a cruise ship, you have the same group watching you, usually for, the, for a week or two, right? So you have to come up with new and exciting things for them to see for each show. You have to be very creative, and that's that is one of the um, one of the demands on our staff here is is you have to be creative um, with your glass making. So Helen's really taken that, and she works on sculpting all kinds of things. A lot of her themes have to do with nature, so that's why she's very good at making little animals and critters. You know, this is kind of like a critter sculpture. Yeah, I like the critters. So here she's just using the regular old butter knife to sculpt in some of the details of those hind quarters. And she's really getting into the action here of sculpting the different parts. She starts with the back end of the deer. Eventually this will be flipped around and then she'll focus on the, the front end and the head and all the decorations here. I'm really good at cutting things uneven. So I already started out with a little bit. One leg's a little bigger than the other, but one thing about sculpting is you're, it's supposed to be fun. So if you don't get it perfectly right the first time, don't worry about it. Just keep playing and practicing. And I, I try not to actually make exact copies of things in nature. There's a lot of uh, very talented artists that have uh, developed their uh, lifelong dream in glass and are perfection of, of the form. But I really like to do a little bit more of a cartoony, kind of gestural uh, look at animals. And of course, they're getting more and more realistic as I learn new, new processes and new techniques. But uh, I don't concern myself too much with getting everything just perfect as it would be in nature. Well, there's this challenge in synthesizing something and simplifying it too. Yeah, for sure. You really see those hind legs starting to emerge. Yeah. A few minutes ago, it was just a blob. Now you'll notice Helen has to go back and forth to that furnace. We got a couple different types of furnaces. I know some of you here may have never seen glass blowing before. So we'll go through the various furnaces. Um, the main furnace where Helen got the glass from, that's called the melter. And down inside of there, there's a big clay pot that holds about a thousand pounds of molten glass. And she just dips down in there with that long rod there. It's a, called a punty iron or a bit iron. We also have a hollow rods we call blow pipes and sometimes we'll blow the glass. She's gonna be doing that eventually here in this process she'll blow up the sort of the main component that all these little creatures will be attached to and we just dip down into that furnace and scoop the glass out and anytime we scoop the glass out of our melter it's called a gather so we gather the glass then we have another furnace that you see uh, Helen's workbench is actually set up next to and that is the reheater and the reheating furnace is just for that, it's for reheating the glass while we're working. As we sit out at the bench, you can see as Helen sort of works with it, it's stiffening. Like those legs were really moving quite a lot when she first sat down to the bench and now they're pretty stiff. So eventually she has to go back to that furnace to keep the glass soft and malleable, and change the shape. The other reason is she has to keep it over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. If it drops below that, the glass is gonna break. So that's one of the challenges of glass making is that you have to work in a certain high temperature range. Now to a glass maker, a thousand degrees is cold. But as you know, that's not really cold. It's all relative based on what you're doing. I'm talking Fahrenheit here, folks. So a thousand degrees 
she doesn't want that to break, so eventually she goes back to that furnace. A little bit of detail with the butter knife there. Oh yeah, every, every sculptor needs a butter knife. That's right. So Helen is now planning on working on the top, the front portion of the deer. So Katie Hubbs is coming over. She's got a little bit of glass on the end of an iron called a punty. And they're going to connect that to the deer. We put a little bit of color on the punty itself in the hopes that when we go to break this free, it'll leave a little color and not leave a blank hole in the color. Right. You can also uh, do two layers, you know, start out with a layer on the inside of an object and then put your outside layer. And then if you end up breaking it free, it has that little bit of a layer on that uh, that you can see through. But just to help save time and, and uh, materials. We're just going with the outer layer. I really love the way that color, look, color looks on the outside of glass. Uh, it's get basically not making it look so glassy. <laughs> but um, So I often just gravitate towards putting color on the surface and try not to burn it too much with the torch. Some colors burn away pretty easily with the torch, but I find this yellow holds up pretty well that I don't have as many concerns with that. But now that I've got this flipped over onto a putty, then I can start to coax out the neck and the front legs of my deer. So this deer is going to be standing up on its hind legs. So uh, the body language might look a little strange as we're building it, but he's gonna be kind of reaching up and decorating the tree here today. So keeping that in mind as I'm angling the legs thinking of how it's going to fit up against the sculpture as a whole. Just get a little more color on there. So do we have any questions from the uh, audience here on site? Yes, sir. Yeah, how, how are we able to see inside of the furnace, right? So the way we are able to see inside of the furnace is that our furnace there, uh, the reheater, the glory hole, that has a window on the back. And then your next question is, why doesn't that window melt like everything else you stick in there? It's a different type of glass. It's fused silica glass. So it has to get to 4,000 degrees before it softens, whereas our glass only has to get to about 2,000 degrees before it starts to soften. So it, it's a pretty durable glass, and uh, it was actually developed right here in the 1930s, right here in Corning, New York. They use it for uh, all kinds of stuff, including spacecraft window, right? And uh, fiber, fiber optics, optical fibers. Was there an internet question? Helen, what interested you in working with glass? Well, let's see. My story of how I got into glass and first involves a karate class, but I was in undergraduate at Bowling Green State University. I went there as a graphic designer, um, thinking that was one of the only ways you could make money as an artist. And so when I got to Bowling Green, though, that you, you had to take a lot of other classes uh, for 2D, 3D, that sort of thing. But as part of an extracurricular class, I signed up for a crappy class and I met a glass blower named Danny Klein in there. And he said, oh, do you know that you have this studio in the art building that you're already a part of? And it's got this amazing material and I really love it and you should come and check it out. And so I went into the studio and as I think m many glass blowers and even glass enthusiasts will agree with me, it's just seductive from the, from the get-go. Uh, I saw all this beautiful glow, there was this music playing in the studio, everybody was working together, it seemed like such a fun place to be, and uh, the, the glass itself just really mesmerized me. 
I don't remember exactly what they were making that day, but I just knew I wanted to get involved. So I signed up for a class uh, for the next semester and continued to learn um, quite a bit there at Bowling Green. And even after I graduated, I wasn't sure what? if that would be something I could continue to do as a career, um, but I got my first job at, out of school working for an artist up in Toledo and got to see a little bit more of the production side and how that worked and just kept getting jobs, kept getting jobs, kept getting jobs, opportunities, and really just fell in love with it and kept, and I'm very lucky that I've, I've managed to work predominantly in glass for most of the 26 years that I've been working with it. And I'm really lucky to be here at the Corning Museum of Glass. We have so many special projects and opportunities to try new things while we're at work or on site. And so it's really been amazing to have all artists come through uh, the museum and traveling the world representing the museum and, and getting all that time on the ships to adventure and try new things. But I don't know, glass just is like no other material. It's the most challenging, frustrating thing you'll ever have uh, do. But it can also be much, very rewarding. And one of the things I really love about it is all the teamwork. So uh, an opportunity like this today to be able to try something that I could not do by myself uh, and with my amazing team is really fun. I want to start up that uh, reef, please. So you don't have to take karate to get into glass, right, Helen? No, you don't have to, but it sure was a nice transition. You know, but <laughs> the thing is, is it just opened yourself up to new things and new, you never know who you'll meet. You'll never know what it'll lead to. And I just think how amazing it was that this crazy class that I took with a bunch of high school buddies uh, led to a full career in glassmaking. That's how it works. So if you're watching, thanks Danny Klein. Get me involved. It's really fun. But I think that's a common story for a lot of glassmakers is that they were in an environment where they just had kind of happened upon it, discovering it while they were in school, discovering it while they were uh, walking past a studio or something. That's a great story. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks. Well, he's going to be a little fatty today. He's eating too many Christmas cookies. So, looks like Kyle is preparing a bit. Helen's going to put a little wreath around the, the neck of this creature. The helpful deer. But my time spent at um, Sheridan and at Bowling Green and at Louisville, I didn't really do a lot of sculpture until I got into grad school. And then you I started to... taking some classes. And I'd like to also give a shout out to Karen Willenbrink. She was my first instructor down at Penland doing uh, sculptural glass. I made all these crabs and sea creatures and things and learned so much during that class. It really kind of opened up my eyes to the possibility of glass not just being something that you make functional objects with. Uh, you can play around uh, and, and have humor in the way that you work. And of course, channel all those nature things that you love. All right, Kyle, are you about ready? Yes, please. All right, so this is just gonna be a bit of green glass that we're wrapping around to create a wreath for a little deer. Getting in the spirit. Snipping away, snipping away. 
snip it away. Trimming. You gotta work quick because it starts to harden really fast. Trimming the wreath. Now it looks like you've got Chris over here. He's working on a bit. I think this is for the deer's head. So Chris, Chris has gathered up some, some glass from the furnace. He's rolled it through the same base color that the deer is, the iris opal gold. And he'll shape that into a little teardrop shape that Helen can form the little deer's head out of. Anybody on site have any other questions? Yes, sir. How do you get the color? So the way we're applying the color right now is with frit. Uh, now frit is crushed up colored glass, so it's pre-made, and then it's crushed into fine uh, chunks about the size of table salt. And then we can roll our clear glass through it, and it'll adhere, it'll stick to the outside and provide sort of a mottled color surface. There's other ways to do it too, where you just use kind of the pure color without being crushed up. Um, probably a hundred different ways you can just apply color, um, but that's how we're coloring it now. Now, initially, to get coloring glass, you have to add metals to it. So a, a good example of that is the blue that everybody loves. It's called cobalt blue, right? You've probably all heard of that. Well, what does that cobalt refer to? That refers to the metal used to make that color blue. It's cobalt. So we also uh, make green glass, and that's with iron. Uh, you can also make brown glass with iron. So different metals added to the glass give it the different colors. Those are just a couple examples. Great question. I'd take any more if you have any. Yes. Say again. We're not going to break this piece when it's done, no. No, some of our guests uh, who are regular visitors know that occasionally when we make demonstrations, we break them right before your eyes. We make it and then we break it. We only save our very best pieces. So if we know it's kind of flawed or something, um, we'll just remelt it, you know? We're making a lot of clear glass pieces right now and we can just break those up and put them back in the furnace at the end of the day, make something better out of it. Yeah, and the, yeah, the other, the other thing, thank you, Amanda. The other thing that I should mention, too, is if this piece comes out uh, at the end, it will be for sale. So, and that's what we do with our, our very best pieces, too. You'll see in the, in the glass market, you'll see some of our work for sale in the front case. So, nope, we won't be breaking this one. Hopefully. Keep our fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to really uh, spoil the surprise, but at the end, we do have one that's uh, complete. So we'll bring that out and show you what it looks like. It's our trial run version. All right, so they're putting the ears on. All right, Chris. That's Chris Rochelle bringing those bits over. Working in tandem with Helen. We always say that glass making requires timing, temperature, and teamwork. The three T's of success in glass. Yeah. So not too long ago, that was just a blob of glass, and now we're seeing the ears and the hooves and the tail, and it's really coming to life. All right, Katie. 
I think Katie's bringing over you bet then? Are you some ready? glass for the You're antlers, like, if I'm not mistaken. So Chris and Katie had two different bits. Thank you. And they, they made two different bits because I think they're different colored glasses. So the ears and the antlers are, are going to be different colors. So they both worked up different bits, rolled them through different colored frit. Now you can start to see the color. When the glass is hot, you don't see the proper color because it's distorted with the heat. Even our clear glass, when it comes right out of the furnace, looks like it's glowing yellow, glowing orange. So that's heat energy in the glass. It'll, it'll distort whatever color you have. And a lot of colors, you don't see the true color until it's down to room temperature. So it's kind of like a painting where it dries down. Yes, what's your question? We have a question on site here. How long does it take to cool down? Well, so Helen is snipping off little pieces of glass here and there. If we drip a little glass on the floor, that's going to cool down in about 15, 10 or 15 minutes, depending how thick it is. The thicker it is, the longer it's going to hold that heat. The thinner it is, the quick, more quickly it dissipates the Somebody heat. Take this? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it would, it would cool down in a few minutes, but uh, it would also break. So when we finish the piece, we have to load it into an oven for a slow cooling process called annealing. So everything we make that we want to save goes into an oven to cool down. And, and the reason for that, I know that sounds funny, we put something in an oven to cool it down, is because we want to cool it very, very slowly. If you cool it or heat it one way or the other too fast, it's going to break because of thermal shock. And that's because the thick parts of the glass are moving differently than the thin parts of the glass because they're cooling at a different rate. And that stress from that different uh, cooling rate is going to cause the piece to break. So we put it into the oven. We hold it at 900 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for at least an hour, you know, and the thicker the piece is, the longer we hold it at that temperature. So everything is homogenous in temperature, and then it cools down all together at the same rate. So the thicker the glass is, the slower the cooling needs to be. And that process is called annealing, annealing the glass. Everything we want to save has to be annealed. I'll be right there. Just give me one second. It's very hard to hear. We've yeah, got another question here in the uh, on-site audience. Yes? Yeah, so, um, no, we, we'll load in one day, we'll load everything into one oven usually, unless we make too many things and we turn on another oven. And then at the end of the day, will turn it off and everything cools together. Everything cools together. Yep. Huh? So it actually sits uh, at an idle temperature all day long. It doesn't immediately start to cool once you put the piece in. Yeah, so you see we have, I mean we have some big ovens that we're not using, but if we're doing production or we have artists who are making large down. things, we turn those on. Sometimes we can only fit one or two Straight pieces in there and the whole oven has to go down. Yep. Great questions, yeah. And just come back to the eyes. So that was a good question. Do we, do we need different ovens for different pieces? We can, we can keep loading the same oven with more than one piece. As long as we can keep fitting glass in there, we'll load it before we turn it down. All right, so this reindeer is really coming together and it might be, it could be Rudolph even. I don't know, what color is that yeah. nose? It's red. It it's is a red Rudolph. nose. So I think this might be yeah. either Rudolph or one of his siblings. It's Rudolph. Wow. He's been eating all his Santa cookies. Yeah. Well, he's going to need it for that big delivery. It's hard to compete with Amazon.
All right. All right, so I'm just gonna check his body language and then we're done with the deer. So just like the glass that is going to be annealed, this deer is gonna have to go into a little oven, an idling oven that will hold it at just over a thousand degrees until we will bring it out and add it to the larger sculpture. And that's the one that's over on the very far right side of our stage. That's called the garage because we park things in there temporarily. So we'll park that deer in there. And then when Helen's ready to bring that out and attach it to the main sculpture, it'll still be at the right temperature that she can keep working with it. Um, you know, if she just set it out on the table, in a few minutes it would be broken. If she put it in the annealing oven, we wouldn't be able to really take it out again uh, to heat it up. And our garage is unique in that it has kind of a cool side which is only about 800 degrees. And then the hot side, which is over 1,000 degrees. So we can take a piece that she makes and then slowly heat it up in that oven and then bring it out, introduce it back into the furnace, and then attach it. So Chris has grabbed that. He's going to kind of let that stabilize a little bit using a torch before he puts that into the garage to set at 1,000 degrees. Helen's gonna grab a quick drink of water while he's doing that. And then we're gonna get started on the main sculpture piece. As Helen had mentioned before, she's got other critters that go along with Mr. Deer. And those are already sitting in the garage. She made some of them yesterday, I think some the day before. So she's built up a little arsenal of parts that are gonna be added onto the the main sculpture. Is it okay to talk about what it is, Helen? Yeah, yeah. So okay. the main sculpture is uh, a tree. So I'm going to get started on the tree now. And then the tree will be uh, lots of woodland creatures are decorating it, getting up to some, some shenanigans uh, as they're hanging out in the winter wonderland. So this is gonna be the start of the, the tree. And for those of you who might not have seen how we're blowing glass these days, we're actually using an alternative blowing device because we keep our masks on all the time so we can't uh, blow through the pipes like we traditionally would. So we've been using this new system with this air compressor and a foot pedal down below. So I'm just gonna start a small air bubble, then I'll start gathering more glass and We'll just keep building it up with color to make the tree. Then once we get the tree, Jeff's going to be working on a nice uh, base for me as I work on this. Oop, helps plugged in. Yeah, there we go. Oop, there's our bubble. And then with the animals that I've made uh, ahead of time, those are all in the garage, and we'll be able to just assemble the piece towards the end. So that's when it's going to be all hands on deck. It's going to get pretty interesting towards the end. Assembling all this. But our trial run went really smooth the other day. So I have great faith in my team. It's going to work out just fine. So this is a core bubble. This is a starter bubble. This is not going to be enough glass for the final tree. She wants to make this quite large because she has several pieces that she sculpted that are gonna be attached to this tree. So it's gonna be pretty big. It's gonna be probably 20 or so inches tall, maybe, thereabouts. Maybe a little less, I don't know. They vary in size. It's not, uh, we're not a factory here. She's only made one of these all the way through before with all the, all the critters on it. So she goes back into the furnace here and she'll do this a couple more times, layering the glass on, gathering, in the layers. A lot of people ask us if we get burnt, and occasionally we do on some of the metal tools is the most common way. Helen takes the blowpipe there and she's run it through a little trough of water to cool it down. That's our pipe cooler. And she cools that down right after a gather just to cool that iron so she can hold it up further by the head without burning her hand. And again, she's layering frit on, this time some green colors for the evergreen. 
Yeah, I really like the immediacy of Frit, too. You can just kind of get colors added on very quickly. They're always very textural, so you can get some visual texture by mixing. I'm going to be mixing two different greens. So starting out with a nice thick layer of opaque green and then putting some more transparent over top of it. And hopefully it'll look just like the branches and the leaves of the tree. What's your project? Sorry, I can't how many how many miles do we walk during the day? <laughs> <laughs> Back and forth to that furnace, probably at least a million billion. <laughs> yeah, I haven't put a fitness tractor on myself. Yeah, yet. we get our steps in. You know, the bigger challenge is just getting up over and over off of that bench. You know, you sit there and you if you go over to the Czech Republic, you'll see the glass blowers over there working standing. You know, they just roll it in a yoke in one spot. They don't sit down and roll it on the arms. So some workers who make glass uh, actually work standing up. It's more, they find it more ergonomic. But having uh, a bench to sit at, especially for work like this, where you're really focused on details, is very nice. You know, it's kind of like sitting in a workbench. I'm, it is a workbench. It's just not your standard traditional workbench, which is a table. This is more like a big armchair. Well, and you roll the you roll the pipe on the big arms. <laughs> so there's a question coming from online: Is the air compressor system to get the pub the bubble a good option for early and beginning glass blowers? I have heard during the classes that the bubble is hard to learn to create. That's a great question, and that's a very appropriate question because it is very difficult to start a bubble uh, when you're a new glass blower. And traditionally, uh, the very best way to inflate the glass when you're starting out is to thumb off or cap the pipe. So you blow into the pipe and quickly put your thumb over the iron. Uh, right now, because of uh, the pandemic, situation, we're using compressed air to blow the glass, so it's kind of an alternative. I wouldn't say it's better uh, to blow the, the glass up that way. It might be easier, though, because you can actually see what's going on a little better. Um, though if you want to learn traditional glass blowing, uh, it's always better to learn uh, the proper way to do it, which is by blowing into the pipe. Um, and that said, you know, we can't do that right now. And I'm sure that um, many new glass blowers are struggling with the problem of having to blow glass with, with a mask on. And, uh, you know, I think people are just going to have to adapt to, to that while we're in the situation. But hopefully we can just add that compressor and the compressed air to our arsenal of tools when we get back to regular glass blowing. Yeah, I've been, I've been saying I'm looking forward to the day it's an option rather than a requirement because there are some really great advantages. You can add a little air as you're working kind of down on the business end of things. And a lot of us have gotten, become very comfortable with this. We're doing daily demonstrations here at the museum. We've been using this system. But I almost forget how to do it the other way at this point. I've been working for so many months. Yeah, it's something you have to get used to. But I would always recommend, if you have the opportunity to learn the traditional way, to learn that first and then use this as an alternative. However, I understand that you know, we're in this time now and, and probably a lot of studios are using alternative inflation methods so that people can continue to wear masks. The other part of it is just sharing the blowpipes with the team around you. You know, you don't want to... In past years, we just kind of understood, well, oh, Chris has a cold. We're all going to have a cold next week, right? <laughs> but now it's, the, it's a, little, a whole different ball game. So we use a lot of um, isopropyl alcohol, clean off everything, all the tools, the grips, and we're doing a pretty good job. 
So Helen is going to layer some more glass on here. This will be your final gather. And then she's going to start adding some, some bits on for garland. She goes back to the furnace, getting the final gather. There's no turning back now. Helen's in it for the long haul. And we're here, we're right here with her. How many gathers is that? I think that's like four, right? Uh, I think it's three. Three gathers. The little one, the big one, and then the outside one. A little big, little big and outside. So little big and outside. How heavy is it? Okay, that's a great question. So that's probably, I'm guessing, about seven pounds. Six to seven pounds of glass there. Is that about right, Helen? Uh, probably, yeah. This is big. This is a big one. Yeah. Is this a little bigger than the last one? I was thinking it was maybe a little smaller maybe than Maybe a little the last smaller. One. That's okay too. Well, that last one was pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> So Helen, there is a question yep. uh, for you. However, I know you're kind of in an intense mode right now, but I want you to think about it while you should be thinking about other things. What is the most difficult piece you've ever made? Is that right? Most challenging? Most challenging piece I've ever made? Ooh. That was the question, right, Amanda? Yeah, okay. You know, I, oh, that's a tough one. I think every new piece that you make ends up being the most challenging thing you've done to date. But um, I, a couple years ago, I did another live stream here at the museum that was an ocean-based theme. And it had a big, um, uh, would, it was a really tall sea fan that had other creatures on it. Oh, yes. And I found that one pretty challenging because of all the marini that went together with it and the, w and the way that we constructed it. But I've worked on a lot of challenging projects with other artists. So if you're asking the most challenging thing of my personal work or the most challenging thing of an, uh, of an artist's work, that would be two different conversations as well. Well, what's just the, m the hardest thing you ever made? in general. But yeah, that sculpture was pretty general. Good. <laughs> Is it the piece that you're making while people are asking in-depth questions? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trying to make this and narrate at the same time. <laughs> All right, I won't bug you anymore, but that was a great question. No, that's a great question. And I would, I would have to concur with Helen. A lot of times the, the most difficult challenges come from artists who, who don't work with glass because they come up with ideas that are kind of far flung and very much think differently than the glass maker. So that's why it's great to get their ideas and work with artists who haven't worked with glass but who have ideas in glass. Now Helen's using the Marva here. And she's packing the glass down to the end so she doesn't blow through the bottom. That's really easy to do. So she uses that marble to cool and pack the glass. I'm gonna hand off to Katie Hubbs here. She's gonna do some narrating while I start up the base for this piece. Hello. Hi, I see a question already. Let me let me answer that. What is that question?
you know what? Jeff's right. It's really hard to hear from in here, especially when that torch is going. So let me come out and talk to you a little closer. It's a whole new ball game out here. All right, what's that question? Oh. Yeah, it depends on when you come back. Um, so if you are leaving and coming back before noon, you'll see it's pretty much almost done and put it away. If you're coming back sometime later today, it'll be in the oven. If you come back tomorrow, okay, no tomorrow. So if you come back after noon, you'll be able to see it. Yeah. No, you won't. It'll be in the oven. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, since this is online, you get to watch this video in a couple more weeks. You can watch it be finished. Um, we'll also post something on social media of the finished piece. So you'll be able to see it, but not in person. Mm -hmm. Corny Museum of Glass uh, Instagram, Corny Museum of Glass Facebook. Yeah, uh, even our, our website. No, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, you all have a wonderful day. Have fun. Yeah, do your thing, awesome. Well, have fun. Oh yeah, anytime, be safe out there. We got a little winter, winter wonderland ourselves, which is beautiful. And it's a, a, such a fitting day to have this lovely snowstorm outside. I wouldn't say it's a storm. I think we're getting like two inches, but. I know, I was so excited when I woke up and I saw snow. Nature's coming out for you there, Helen. I know. Not always a huge fan of snow when I gotta go to work, <laughs> drive, clean the car, but yeah, it sure is beautiful. All right, well, since I'm new on the mic now for today, I'm Katie. I'll narrate uh, for mostly the majority of this. I think Helen's gonna stay on the mic with me too, but um, this is gonna get a little intense, so I think she might she might turn hers off later on, we'll see. Um, but of course, reintroducing, we've got Helen Tegler here. This is her project. Um, we're doing a winter wonderland scene. Jeff Mack here as well. He's going to, um, right now he's helping to create the base of this. We've got Chris Rochelle, who's greatly going to be helping out. And uh, let's see, we've got Amanda Kranz on the. Yes. We've got Kyle here as well. Jason upstairs on the video. Yep, Jason on the video. Thanks, Helen. I'm giving him a real challenge today because we're jumping all over the studio, doing all kinds of different things. All right, so um, we need a base for this piece to be put onto, for this to sit flat and also to kind of host some of our other critters that are going to be added. So. Jeff is creating that base. This will be a blown form, just like what Helen is doing, so of course a different shape. And so it looks like the colors that Jeff is adding on are white. So white frit going on to that. We've got two different types of white, I believe. Um, the opal white is a bit more like snow. So we're adding on some opal white. It's a little bit more transparent than our enamel white, which is one basic white. The uh, opal white is a bit more transparent. So it'll look more snowy. Chris here has our wrap for the piece. So we are going to wrap this piece up with um, kind of, it's like a snowy garland. Trade you. Okay, Chris awesome. has got that, great. So this is the rollers. How are you feeling on this? Okay, all right. Nah, These are rollers right. are gonna help us to add this on because this is quite a dynamic part of the process. We want this to be pretty wacky. So we're really gonna need to turn, 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 turn as we add this on and here we go. Now watch this, Chris will just turn and Helen's gonna Whip that thing on there. How dynamic is that? The crazier the better. And so we are just drawing that glass off of the pipe that Helen has, the bit 
being added and stuck onto our tree. Nice. And she whips it down, which breaks that thread, and then back to the oven to get that all melted in. Nicely done, team. We can get rid of this on the marver. Thank you. It gives her Perfect more thing. marver to use. That table in the middle of the studio, a very important part of our hot shop. You can use it to host for it. You see, we sit stuff on it. You can also use it to cool and shape the glass. That's its first function is to cool and shape our glass. And I believe Helen will do that here shortly. helps to make a nice cylinder shape. This is going to be a cone shape. That helps too to make a nice cone shape. So you'll see that in action. Yeah, the hardest part is not breaking off all the little bits. Yeah, you got but it. I love how the, the cage around it starts to melt in and intermix with each other. Yeah. You get some really interesting uh, textures when doing Definitely. That. I think actually we'll just go straight to the b-board. Yeah. Could you move that towards the front edge, please? And it might need to be held from the back end so it doesn't bounce around. All right, now watch Helen use this V block here. She's just gonna sure. load it in there and then turn, turn, turn. And that helps to put that into a really even shape. Yeah. I just kidney beat it. Collapse in it. Let's get some air. Get the hair, air hooked back up, please. Looks like I might have a thin spot. So the shape of this, she wants it to be as even as possible. That V block is going to help quite a bit. There's lots of back and forth no, from the bench, the oven, to the V-block, back to the bench. Really using our time wisely to keep all the heat in this piece as we shape it. And then we can start to cool it down. Right now is fast moving time. So you can see how teamwork is really important for glass blowers. I wouldn't say it would be impossible for Helen to do this by herself, but extremely challenging. It wouldn't be any fun. Exactly. We like to we like to spend time with others and work in the hot shop with others. And we need them to complete the things that we want to make. See, you've got a team of one, two, three, four, five here. And the more people you see on a team, the more in-depth, detailed the piece is going to be. But also, the more fun you're going to have. So Jeff here is in charge of making the base for this. So far we've got a round shape. And Helen is going to briefly flatten the bottom of this, I believe. 
but it's going to go on to this base. So the flatness has to remain a characteristic of the base. So she doesn't really have to flatten it too much, I don't think. In order for these two to come together, they both have to be ready. And that's why Helen told Jeff at a certain point to start this piece so that their timing would match up. So Helen is getting her part ready. Same here with Jeff. Once we get these two stuck together, we have time to add critters to the piece. All right, so a little rough and tumble tree there. Now we got uh, Jeff, he's making the base uh, for this. And it's meant to be kind of a snowy hill. So he's using two different white colors. This is all meant to be a snowy scene. So most of it, I'm just babysitting at this point. So Helen needs to keep the piece that she has hot. She needs to keep it above a thousand degrees. She can't just set that down and go have a cup of coffee while she's waiting for Jeff. She's got to keep it hot. And if we let this glass cool down below a thousand degrees, we could risk breaking that glass. Oh, that's pretty burned out. So they are going to do what's called babysitting. So they're going to maintain that temperature. They'll go into that reheating chamber every once in a while for a brief moment. That's called a flash. Flash that piece, not getting it too hot, and they'll come out. not staying outside of that reheating chamber for too long. We'll let it sit for a moment. All right, so we'll make a punty here for the base of this, we have to also keep in mind that this punty is going to host the entire thing. So the shape is very important. This punty, however, is going to go on the inside of that bubble. Okay. Yeah, this dome shape is a really nice way of creating bases for sculpture pieces because it's not a solid base, it's not super thick, it it's won't take ragged, forever, but... it takes some weight off of it, but you still get a lot of volume out of the shape. Yeah. The hardest part is just lining it up. And I think the timing of things can be really tricky. We've done this once before and we thought, oh, well, Jeff should start a little sooner. I should start a little later, vice versa. Working with teams, I'm really familiar with my team. I know the strengths of everyone and what they're uh, best suited for to help me out, which is really nice to have a consistent team that you work with on a regular basis. And of course, here at Corning, we've got the best. So it's not a hard choice finding a good team. Jeff is very generous to come out and volunteer today. 
helped me out. He's got many years of glass making experience. We actually both went to Bowling Green State University, so known each other a very, very long time. Just want to give a plug as well for our future Bring the Heat live streams. Jeff did one, uh, he was the first one that we did this spring or this fall. Made a Guggenheim goblet. You can check that out on our website. Chris also did a really great uh, demo a few weeks ago doing that Bring the Heat, doing some air trap goblets. So a lot of great technique. And all those and all of the demonstrations, you know, George Kennard made a really nice multiple and call mode, very complicated cane pattern vessel. And we're going to keep building that uh, repertoire and there's thousands of hours of, of uh, demonstrations that you can resource online. That's one of the really nice things as well is that the museum is documenting, documenting all of these. And we like to think of this as a, a good education and inspiration as well. So if you're out there making artwork based on something you saw on our website, let us know. Leave some comments on the video that you resource some of those techniques. Post to our social media. It'd be really fun to see the kind of things that other glass workers are making out there based on something you might have seen here at the museum. in a year where a lot of summer programming and studios weren't able to offer the workshops that they normally would. I know I would not be the glassmaker I am today without opportunities to study at places like the Corning Museum of Glass, Pilchuck, Haystack, Penland, private studios. Those art organizations are really the heart of the community. So I'm really honored to be able to work here and really fortunate in my glass career to have volunteered, taken classes, worked at a lot of those different craft schools. Had a residence here, residency here at the Corning Museum of Glass a few years ago. Those are such important developmental opportunities for artists. seen a great support coming from the community to the museum here and I'm sure many of those organizations have as well but if you are thinking about your Christmas gifts holiday giving definitely keep Corning Museum of Glass and all of those craft schools in mind How we doing, Jeff? That's looking great. No, you're doing good. ready to add these two together so Jeff has hunted um, the base up and now to get these two pieces to stick together we have to heat both of them and we want them to be hot enough to stick of course we, this is a connection that we want to be very solid so we want a lot of heat for this So we're torching the tips. Uh, Jeff is torching the tip of the base, and Helen is torching the bottom of that tree, the base of that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're making sure that these two pieces are very warm. And then we'll stick them together. 
want this to go as uh, on as straight as possible. So that's important. Right now we're both, both teams are maintaining the temperature, heating in the right spots. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Down, down. So we'll roll them back to in fourths and make sure that they're on center. We've got a good stick. So the punty is attaching to the tree, so we're actually going to break the tree free. To do that, a couple drops of water right on that connection mark there that she added, and a light tap should break this free. All right, nicely done. A clean break and a successful punty transfer. So we have puntied up the base, brought the base over to the tree, added the tree on to the base, broke the tree from its blowpipe, and now we need to get this ready to have critters added to it. So a couple of things, of course, we did just break the glass on the top part there, and we need to fix that. So that didn't break in, in any bad way, it broke perfectly, actually, right evenly around the top there, and we need to break or we need to uh, clean it up a bit, you know? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so that really squished on there, but that's okay. We're going to go ahead and start shaping up the top edge of it. So um, the second refinement is just kind of pulling out the top of the tree. And so Chris is getting ready uh, to start manning the garage. He's going to be my master garage uh, coordinator over there. Again, we made a lot of these parts uh, well in advance so that we could have them all ready to go. It's really challenging to do um, large-scale sculpture like this in a limited amount of time, so uh, it's good to make a lot of parts. And those garages are really nice because you can end up making all kinds of stuff and putting them away for safekeeping. All right, Jeff, one more little piece like that. That's great. And Katie, if you can start just monitoring the back lip of that. Yeah, yeah. Be yeah, on my torch duty. All right, I see Chris over there in the garage starting to prepare to bring out our critters. We have a deer, an owl, a raccoon. We have a surprise guest coming from the inside of the tree. And we have a cardinal to sit on top. A Katie Hope State Cardinal. <laughs> All right. So to close this off, so I do believe we're going to close it off here. Helen's going to make a line in the glass. So she's doing that with a pair of jacks, and she's also pulling the tree out quite a bit. So that helps to continue the uh, kind of linear shape that we have going. And so we've got two torches going. Here we've got a bench torch, which is the loud one, the large one. It's about 2200 degrees about 100 degrees hotter than our furnace. And our furnace is at 2100 degrees, and that's the piece of equipment that we keep putting the tree back into to give it all overheat. These torches are going to spot heat the glass. 
And as you see, as we go in and out of this furnace, there is one part of this piece that is the last thing to enter and the first thing to come out, which therefore means it is the colder part. And that's where we're going to add extra heat when it's needed. Helen is using a smaller torch called the mid-range torch to heat one particular area. She won't use it for right now. She'll bonk that little bit off. Sure. So we bonk that little bit off and that gives us sealed tree. Okay. Still wanting to maintain the top shape here. I do see that we have a small hole, I think. I can cut, yeah, there's a hole in that. So it is open still. that up a bit more. And so from here on out, we don't want this piece to really move very much. Of course, a small bit of movement is probably a little healthy. It depends on how we want this uh, to go from here. But this is a part of the process where the whole piece stays and that not too hot and not too cold temperatures. We don't want it to be so hot that we change the shape of the piece. We don't want it to be so cold that we risk cracking the piece. Helen right now is going to poke a hole with a tungsten rod here. And this allows for air to escape. Without it, sometimes we could cause a vacuum to, to uh, happen in the piece. We don't want that. We don't want a vacuum. So we'll drill a little hole there so that we can safely seal this up and not have any implosions or uh, deformation of the shape. The what on? Our surprise guest, yeah. We're gonna put that one on first, yeah, sure. great tool. Um, it'll keep everything safe, warm, and happy. All right, Jeff. So that'll be the back, go to the front, right here. Right here, Jeff. All right, so now we're going to heat specific areas to add on all of our critters. So Chris has all of the critters in that garage. The garage is at a thousand degrees. It's keeping all of those pieces of glass warm. And so that means that we can take them out and start getting them warm and add them on to this piece, which is much, much hotter than that. Go ahead. This piece is probably probably between 1,200. I wouldn't say any hotter than about 16, 17. Maybe not. We don't want it to move, so probably around 1,500. So this piece here, we heated it up to where it can go on to this Got piece. Him. And here is our special guest, Mr. Abominable Snowman. 
peeking his little head out of the tree. All right. Very nice. So we heat both ends there with a torch, which of course causes the glass to become goopy and sticky. And that hot glass will stick to hot glass. And we can add it right on the tree. Yeah. And that is one of many other pieces. <laughs> one of many creatures. Many creatures. We have a critter. Next, I believe, is our Day. arm. It's a left hand. Is that right, Chris? Oh, yeah. That's I right. right hand. Mr. Abominable Snowman is starting a snowball fight. So Helen has sculpted his arm that's going to come out of this tree. Chris, of course, is heating this up in our garage on a paddle. So he has lots of tools that will allow him to take that out. You see, we're using pipes as kind of handles to hold onto our glass. If our piece isn't attached to a pipe, we can use a paddle or a fork even to hold the glass piece and bring it to the space that we need to bring it to. <laughs> Chris is operating that panel. Here comes the arm. This will be added onto the spot that she just preheated and spot heated with our torch. And this torch in Helen's hand can go up to uh, around 4,000, even higher than that degrees. So she superheats that glass and just sticks it right into that tree, giving us the beginnings of a snowball fight. So in his hand, he's holding a snowball. I believe that's going to be a part of the theme for the rest of this tree. I need some white bits scattered up, so just leave that open. There Like we're going to add more snowballs and more snow effect for this. So um, Kyle is going to get some clear glass from our oven and roll it in some of our snow, which is our crushed up glass color called Frit. It coats the outside of that glass and gives us a wonderful color. as what we call glue bits. And so this glass, when it's hot, it's sticky, and you can stick other hot things to it. And so we can add the sticky glass onto our glass. And then 
we can stick things to that sticky glass on the glass. And that's just what we'll do. So it's time for our raccoon. He's got three snowballs in his hands. He's excited and ready to start the snowball fight. So here, Helen's gonna stick the raccoon right onto that little snow mound. Seems as if he got the snowballs in his hand from the snow mound he's sitting on. So we have an owl being added on to our tree. The owl is adorable, like all creatures on us in this scene. And Helen made these creatures earlier. So she's been working all week long to create these creatures for this very demonstration. And she even created extra. So not to jinx her or any of us here, but she did create extras just in case something were to go awry. But she also created them because she enjoys doing it. So she enjoys making small uh, pieces of glass, small critters. So she made those extras. Chris is doing an excellent job pulling those creatures out of the garage. It's um, a very challenging thing to do to get something to go from a thousand degrees quickly into a 2100 degree hole can be very risky. And Chris knows how to do it properly. And he's making it look very easy. So here comes our owl. He's just going to stick him down into that tree and then direct him or her, this creature, on where to go. like this, everybody's doing something, especially right now in crunch time. So Chris is heating a piece. Kyle is getting a glass out of our oven to be used as snow. Jeff is heating the pipe so Helen doesn't have to. Helen is dictating the team. I'm chatting to you and running the torch. So while Chris is getting uh, our deer ready, there's a little bit of prep work he's going to do with the torch and stuff to get him all in position. So we're going to start adding some more snowballs. Why not? Going to put a couple more things onto the sculpture itself.
slippery with gloves on. <laughs> if you didn't hear. Okay, another snow addition here. She's gonna make this into a snow ball shape. She can do this quickly. Lots of talent, lots of skill here. By creating little balls on the end with um, a tool called diamond shears. And so they cut kind of 3D instead of 2D, like our traditional shears, our kitchen shears at home. So they okay. cut in the round, they cut in the circle themselves. So that really helps to make a round snowball for this. Now, just give me one second, Chris. add snowball by snowball. And she can even get more glass and add more snowballs, which I think will help round out our snowball theme. I'll save that for now. Nicely done. Now we're heating for uh, the addition of the deer. So, so the, sh the one that she created right before we started our tree, um, our tree and critter scene, she made a deer, in case you missed it. Uh, we put the deer in the garage, just like with all the other critters. Helen didn't make all of those critters today, like I mentioned earlier as well. She made them throughout. You can then put them in the garage and send the garage up, which slowly heats up those bits. The deer, though, you can take right from making it, put it into that garage as well, and it will sit with the rest of the pieces. And here we go. So she found a spot. She's going to stick the deer down. Both little hooves there. Sure, it's cute. Great positioning. Now we have our deer. I believe we have still one more piece left. Well, we want to add more snowballs first. Helen says she wants to add some more snowballs around the ankles for security. A lot of glass sculpture, um, a lot of kind of features of it are to secure different bits to it as well. We can hide those as features.
So here at the Corning Museum of Glass, every Wednesday, unless there's a holiday, we are doing um, a, a live stream. So this is Helen's live stream. Recently in the past, we did a You Design It live stream. So every other week we're doing You Design It as well. And so George Kennard helped create uh, the avocado doctor named Bob. And it was a great success and it was so adorable. I think we're gonna post a picture of him today on our Instagram, so that will be fun to see. So next week, I believe we do have a YDI, and then we're gonna take a holiday break, come back, and then all spring we have live streams on Wednesdays. So every other week, so YDI, or you design it, or you can submit a drawing online to the Corning Museum of Glass website. We'll pick the one we wanna do that week, we'll create it, and then we'll send it to you. So that's a really fun program, and you can do it from home. We love that. And so every other week from the YDIs, we do a bring in the heat. And so for our bring in the heat demonstrations, this is Helen's bring in the heat. It's focused on her. The recent one before her, I believe was Chris Rochelle. And he did uh, some really wonderful uh, air twist goblets. And that was a really fun one to watch. George Kennard has made one, Jeff Mack. And the next spring, we're featuring more of our gaffers that we have here, the studio, or the uh, Hot Glass Show Museum. Stay tuned, we've got a lot of cool things, really uh, wonderful things happening at the Corning Museum of Glass these days. And all things you can do from home, but of course, if you can make it to the museum, come on by. It might be snowy, it's snowy today. The roads are clean and clear. I don't think we've got about maybe, maybe an inch out there right now. So adding snowballs currently, also maintaining the temperature here. To go along. This is actually gonna be garland. So the tree is decorated with garland. And Helen, uh, she wants to represent the deer who added on all this garland by adding some garland to the deer as if the deer has added it on himself. So she's pulling a little bit of garland out of this glass bit that she's got. She's gonna string it now down onto the tree. It looks like he's adding it on.
cardinal time. No, we'll do it this time. All right, so the final tree tapper here can be this beautiful cardinal. Their one and only K hubs made for me. a little topper. Seems it happens to be the stink bird where I grew up in Ohio. So it's nice to get a little hometown in there. Oh, he's so cute. All right, so now that we got all the parts, I just want to kind of look it over, make sure there's nothing sharp. I think put a couple of those snowballs. I don't think a snowballs is being too sharp, but maybe they're pretty icy today. I need to smooth those out just a little bit and start uh, flashing this down. I'm going to be putting this away in the oven. It'll uh, cool overnight. Put it on a nice long cycle. Helen wants to slowly cool this down to a temperature that we can put it away at. That's what flashing this down means. So. It is right now probably too hot to go into the oven. And there are also certain areas that are a little cold to go into that oven. So we want everything to be the same temperature and then be put away. And so all glass needs to go through a process where it slowly cools in order to reach room temperature. That slow cooling process is called annealing. And so around our stage, we have annealers big and small, where we can put our glass into and then let it cool slowly overnight. This piece itself will go into one of these annealers at 900 degrees. So they're all at 900. That's a really great holding temperature for glass. So we can probably put other things into it today if we wanted to. Yeah, we'll do one more flash. And as I promised, we'll pull out the finished one here in a minute. Um, that we did a couple days ago, just so the folks here in the house and at home can see uh, what we're, our first trial, trial run was. One more. And so something like this might need about a 24 hour cycle, if not a little bit more. It depends what Helen wants to do for this, but glass generally could go down between about uh, eight and 12 hours, depending on the thickness. The thicker the glass is, the more time we wanna add to our annealing process, annealing cycle. I think, I think it's pretty good, huh? And we're about ready to put it away. To get this off of that punty connection, Jeff created a small crease line between the punty and the piece, and that's where we're going to break this free. All right, so to do that, a couple of drops of water right on that mark, and a light tap, Chris will take it fire polish the inside there and Chris will put that into the oven very slowly carefully put it into the oven and the way it goes for safekeeping we will see that beautiful scene I think later it's definitely on taller than the last one <laughs> all right and that's Helen Tegler, everybody and thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in online and coming to visit us here in person. We really appreciate your support, and I hope everyone has a hap happy and safe holiday season. Uh, we do have the piece down here. I don't know if Jason, you can focus on it a little bit, um, just to show you kind of the practice piece that we did. But we'll have pictures of the actual one uh, up online when it comes out of the oven as well. And as the, I think somebody mentioned, these uh, live streams that we're doing are all for sale this year. So this will eventually go into the shop to help support the museum and all the fantastic programming that we do here. So uh, thank you so much in advance for your support of that as well. Are there any other final online questions? All right, well, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Have a great holiday.